Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Hello, welcome to our verse by verse in depth Bible study with Bible Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Now, here's Bob. Because it's going to be dealing with some concepts that we're not very familiar with. So I hope that you'll follow in your outline with me. And I hope that um, you'll kind of hang with me uh, mentally. Because you're going to need to follow with me pretty closely. Uh, A lot of things are being touched tonight. Where Jesus went. Tonight I want to pick up on verses 1 through 11, which are really going to be a going back to to chapter 3 to pick up from some emphases that Peter didn't make in chapter 3, but passed over for other things, and now he's coming back to pick up these major emphases. And so let's read together, if we could, verse 1. So then, since Christ has suffered in our physical form, you too must arm yourselves with the same determination. Now, I'm reading Williams' translation, and people still ask me, why do you use a translation that we can't buy? Why do you use one that's not normal? The very fact that I uh, read one that you're not familiar with is for the very purpose of you having to follow with me by words and phrases in your translation, because yours doesn't sound like this. And the whole purpose is to start getting you to look at words and phrases and what they mean and why they're put that way and why translations differ and, and on and on. One of the basic elements in interpreting the Bible is to have at least two translations that you compare one another on every passage. One, uh, to make it a King James or an older translation or whatever, and then a, a very different translation. I'll tell you, a good balance to the King James Bible would be the RSV that has many different manuscript variations or the older American Standard Version. I bought one from Winston a couple of years ago, got a paperback, hardback, for $13. And I think the American Standard Version is the closest English translation to the Hebrew and Greek text. Matter of fact, it's so literal. Translation is poor English. But if you want to study Bible, that's just the kind that you want. So I hope you'll think about buying another translation to, to read along with yours. Now, it says that Christ has suffered. Mine has in our physical form. A little more literally there means in the flesh. Now, we're not using Paul's idea of the word sarx, meaning sin nature, but simply flesh and bones, body, the incarnation, John 1, 14. Uh, the idea of the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, when it says that Christ suffered in physical form, we need to look and see that that thought is not complete biblically. There's something that's gone before that to set the stage for the readers to understand that we're talking about the vicarious substitutionary atonement of Christ. Chapter 3, verse 18, sets the stage for this, but he starts dealing with those spirits in prison, gets away from this for a while, and now he's coming back to it. Okay? When it says you must arm yourselves, now this is a military term. It's most often used in Greek literature to speak about a soldier arming himself with heavy armament for a battle. Now, it is used by Paul, biblically, to speak of arming yourself with the right kind of tool. So I can't be too dogmatic, but I really think the background here is Peter saying, as Paul did in Ephesians 6, verses 10 and following, put on the full armor of God. There's a spiritual battle going on. I think Peter would say the same thing. Remember, the background of this book is that persecution has come. I feel like it's unofficial persecution that hit the recipients of this letter, which would be somewhere in Asia Minor, the date somewhat unknown, uh, 60s in there. But I still think he's trying to prepare them for the spiritual battle that's going to come as persecution hits their lives. And so he's saying, arm yourself, get ready for battle, stand your ground. With the same determination. Now, I don't know if you have read much in theology on the different views of the atonement. There are all kinds of views of the atonement. And it's just a classical case of theology proof texting. One verse would say it's the vicarious substitutionary atonement. 
One verse would say it's a, uh, Christ was our example. And on and on it goes. And they pick certain verses and leave other ones out. So no one theory is complete. But here we have the example of Christ our example. The great pathfinder for us. Whose footprints we are to walk in. Now, if Jesus suffered in the flesh, we ought to be prepared for physical suffering. Jesus mentioned in John 15, 20, and in Matthew 10, 24 and following, that if they have treated me this way, the master, what in the world are they going to treat you like, the servants? And so we need to expect the rejection of the world. Now, one of the problems the world has not rejected us is because we have been so captured by the world system in which we live that there is no observable difference usually in the life of a Christian, the life of a non-believer, as far as socially and culture goes. That's a tragedy. We are no longer salt speaking to our world. We have become salt that's put on the footpath. And I think you need to think about that. If Jesus' love had such vehement reaction to it, our sacrificial love ought to have that kind of reaction in our world. And when it doesn't, it means we're simply not being the kind of witnesses and lights and salt that we ought to be. Okay, and then the last part of verse 1, for whoever suffers in his physical form has done with sin. Now, I don't think we're talking about Christ anymore. I think we're talking about the recipients of this letter. Uh, Christ dealing with sin is a unique thing that we can't even emulate. He died on our behalf, a vicarious kind of thing. But we suffer for our own sin. And by that I mean not only temporal judgment where sin naturally reaps the course in our physical lives. But in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, which I think is one of the declarative passages on the doctrine of original sin, all men have been affected by Adam's failure. And that failure is rampant in the human race. That's why all men die. Now, physical death is a judgment on sin. And all men die. Now, notice if, uh, where it mentions here, whoever suffers, aorist tense. Now, because it's aorist tense, and because we're dealing with the concept of dying to sin, many, many commentators believe this is an allusion by Peter to baptism. Now, they're going back to Romans chapter 6, where it talks about that we have been buried with Christ. If we have died to sin, we should live no longer in it. And therefore, the allusion here is the brand new lifestyle that comes, the day we trust Christ, that is pictured in baptism. Now, I'm, I'm not sure that's what Peter's talking about. If you're looking for that, you can certainly find it here. But um, I'm not completely convinced that baptism is the ritual allusion that Peter's making. Now, when it says has done with sin, that is a perfect passive indicative. Perfect means it's done in the past, it abides in the present. Passive means the subject of the sentence is not doing the action of the verb, but is being acted on by an outside source. And so what we have here is that God is doing something. By wooing us to himself, by indwelling us with his uh, spirit, he is doing something to our relationship with sin. That's why it's so inappropriate for someone to claim to know Christ and then his lifestyle be habitually characterized by sin. John says that's impossible. 1 John 3, 6, and 9. Now, in verse 2, so that he no longer can spend the rest of his earthly life in harmony with human desires, but in accordance with the will of God. Christianity teaches a radical departure from our lifestyle once we know Christ. It is impossible to say we know Christ and remain in sin. Now, I don't think that everybody changes overnight. It depends on our background, the extent of the change. But you cannot meet the Lord, and our lives and perspective and priorities remain the same. We have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies. We do not live for ourselves anymore. Once we come to know Jesus, we live for His priority, live for His goals. The, the, the whole goal of the Christian life is that more and more we can have the heart of Christ, the eyes of Christ, the hands of Christ, the mouth of Christ. That's what God's working for in our life. Um, <clears throat> verse 3. For the time is past is enough for you to have accomplished what the heathen like to do. Now, this little phrase, for the time is past is enough, is a perfect verbal form. It means 
It's happened in the past. It abides in the present. What he's saying is it's finished, it's closed, it's complete. It ought to be over with. Now, this is a quote, if you believe it or not, from the Old Testament, or at least a, a, a verbal allusion. If your translation does not show you that that is a quote, you need to think about finding a new translation. And the quote comes from Ezekiel 44, 6. Most modern translations are very helpful in the fact that at least the New American Standard I'm familiar with that I use when I do the Old Testament or preach capitalizes Old Testament quotes. And that helps us to see we're dealing with an allusion or a direct quote from the Old Testament. So that's uh, from Ezekiel. Now, when it says, for you have accomplished what the heathen like to do, here is a perfect example. I want, I want you to look at me and think for a minute. I have told you over and over that I am an exegete, which is a Greek word that means to lead out of the text, as over against an eisegete, which leads into the text. But I want to show you how hard it is to take these glasses of theology, the glasses of culture, the glasses of what we've always heard off. Here is a verse that both sides use as a proof text for why they're right. Now, if both sides can use it for a proof text of why they're right, it means the verse is not definitive and that each side comes speaking to the Bible instead of the Bible speak to it. And, of course, I'm dealing with the fact of who are the recipients of the letter. Now, one side says... It is obvious that they're Jews who have been living like pagans and therefore Peter is writing to Jewish Christians. And the other side said, no, it's obvious they're Gentiles and they've been doing their own thing in their society and obviously Peter is writing to a converted Gentiles. Obviously, this verse does not say either way, <laughs> does it? No, it is very ambiguous. It can mean either one and... Uh, We've got to watch. See, what we do is we come to the Bible with what we know it already says. We come with preconceived notions, a priori understandings, and then we just read the Bible to back up what we already know it says. Now, we're really guilty of that. We've got to watch like the plague about that kind of thing. So I don't know who the recipients are. It just doesn't fit here. But here's an example, a list of sins of what the heathen do. Now, when you read that list of sins in our day, I know what you're going to do if you're not careful. You're going to play like it's the morning newspaper and you're reading these things as they apply to 20th century America. And you're going to, going to apply your definition to these terms without remembering that the New Testament is an ancient book, 1900 years old, written in a different language to a different culture. And if you don't see the cultural background of Peter... You're going to totally miss what he's saying. Now, let's think through here. The scene is Asia Minor. The people there are worshiping cults, the mystery religions, Dionysius, Cybele, um, the god Bacchus. And these heathen have been doing it. They have been doing it as a religion. The sins that he's going to list are the open, public Sins done in the name of a Greek god. These aren't private sins. You see, we read it and think it's talking about private sins. This is open, public, uh, Asia Minor religion that he's talking about. Done in the name of God. Worship is what this is. Now, look at this list. Steeped in sensuality. Now, that's the word. You probably have lasciviousness, which is a $3 word that means excess. And it doesn't mean sexual excess primarily. It means excess in everything. It's doing everything overboard, okay? Okay, lasciviousness, lustful desires, drunkenness, carousing, reveling, dissipation, and idolatry that leads to lawlessness. Now, this was happening in public in God's name. <laughs> yeah, I know it just wipes you out. If we had a Lubbock orgy for Jesus, it would be somewhat what this is talking about. Can you imagine that? No. He just doesn't communicate to you at all. That's what they did. To worship the God Bacchus, they got crocked out of their minds. They went into a ritual frenzy. And you can imagine the rest. Now, that's what they were doing. This is the worship of God. That's why these, these believers had to be indoctrinated quickly of what God was like, what was appropriate, what was inappropriate, because their whole background was different. 
And if you don't read this in context, you're going to misinterpret badly to our day. Now, <clears throat> verse 4. They are astonished that you are not still rushing hand in hand with them and of the same excesses of, of... I don't even know what that kind of word is in my translation. It means overboard living. And they abuse you for it. Now, I think, personally, it's Gentile believers that have been converted. They're using Jewish, the Old Testament, as a catechism to teach them. And so I don't think we're talking about primarily Jews, but... The people that, uh, I remember when I started to preach, um, I told my friends on a Saturday, we were having a typical beer bust in my house. I said, guys, I want you to know the Lord has called me to preach. And I'm letting my apartment go. I'm going back home to save money so I can go to, to college. They roared. Roared. Thought it was hilarious. You know, Utley has really put a big one on us. They just couldn't believe it. I was, I was very serious. They thought I was kidding. Did you know that every one of those friends became nervous about me? None of them came around after that. I even had an operation on my leg after working on the oil fields a few months. None of those friends that had been, you know, all the time over, none of them came by to see me. Why? I had broken with their lifestyle and they felt very uncomfortable around me. That's what's happened here. These people that they had been running with, suddenly, you weren't doing all the things they were doing, and they just wrote you off. Matter of fact, it was worse than that in Asia Minor. They started saying ugly things about you. They started saying that you're an atheist and a cannibal, and all and on and on. They challenged the early church because they didn't understand the terminologies the church was using. And so that's what we have. Lost, lost all their social acquaintances right here. But they will have to give an account for it to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Now, the word him there is capitalized in your Bible, right? So obviously it's part of the Godhead. The question is, what part? I get so tickled at theology books who say, obviously it means Jesus. Because in so-and-so passage, Jesus gives all the judgment to the Son, and that settles it. I wanted to, you know, this morning, I want, Winston and I were visiting afterwards and talking about the fact that we feel like that as we talk to Christians, that sometimes Christians are very ignorant of the Bible and yet think they know very much. You know what we do? We pick out about five proof texts, five passages. We memorize those, and that's all we quote on any subject and think we really know the Bible. Five or ten proof texts. <laughs> now, that's exactly what theology does, unfortunately. The Bible mentions that God is judge, that Jesus is judge, and that both are judged, all the New Testament. I want to give them to you so you can see how we've got to take all the Bible seriously and not just one part. Let me give you some verses. The certainty of judgment, all men, is Matthew 12, 36, Hebrews 9, 27. The fact that judgment will be done by God, the Father, Romans 14, 12, 1 Peter 1, 17, which is the context of this book, that it's going to be done by Jesus. John 5, 22 and 27, Matthew 16, 27, Acts 17, 31, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, 2 Timothy 4, 1. That it's going to be done by both of them, Romans 2, 16, Acts 10, 42. You can't make a dogmatic statement about who the hymn is. Now, you can if you proof text. You can't if you try to take all the biblical revelation seriously. But the fact that judgment is coming, that it will be done by a triune God, is certain. Now, who's going to be judged? Well, the context says the people who are blasting you for your faith. Now, it says who is ready to judge the living and the dead. That's a biblical metaphor. For those who have died and those who are alive, it means that just because you die doesn't mean that judgment's not going to miss you. The living and the dead is a common biblical metaphor for those who have who are lived and already died and those who are still alive. Now... Verse 6 is one of those verses that have caused tremendous problems in interpretation. I'm going to give you three theories. I'm going to show you the weakness and the strengths, and then I'm going to let you make up your own mind. <laughs> okay, here it is. This is why the good news is preached to the dead too, that they may be judged in their physical nature as men, but live in the Spirit as God does. Now, I told you last week when I was dealing with chapter 319 about Jesus preaching to the spirits in prison, 
that this verse was somewhat related. And I think we have to say that it is for this reason. Chapter 4, verse 1 is an allusion to 318, which is the lead-in text to 319. 319, and we're in the same literary context, deals with the spirits in prison. And then right after that, he comes back to the major themes again of chapter 3, and he hits this idea again. So I think they've got to be somehow related to each other. Even if there are different persons involved, related. Now, the second, thing, the second one is that we're talking about those who are spiritually dead. The Bible over and over and over says that man is spiritually dead. Let me give you some verses on that. I think you probably know them all. But Ephesians 2.1, 2, 2.5, 2, 5.14, Colossians 2.13, Luke um, 15.24 and 32. Now, this is a popular theory of Augustine, Erasmus, Luther. That's an easy way to get around it. What it means is that in the same sentence almost that the author is using the word dead in two different ways. He's using it for physically dead and spiritually dead. Now, we have some biblical evidence for that. Jesus used that in the passage Vernon read this morning. He who doesn't give up his life will lose his life, but he who gives up his life for me will save his life. It's all the same Greek word there. One means higher life. One means uh, uh, physical life. But they're the same word, so we have some precedent. Now, what I personally think it is, although I like that spiritually dead, Theology-wise, it doesn't fit the context worth a twaddle. So, um, I like, all human beings die because of sin. Genesis 3.19. They've been judged in their physical nature. They were judged by the very fact that they died. Death is part of the curse of man's sin. Well, what does it mean, preach so they'll live in the Spirit? I think it's talking about the preaching of the gospel to them before they die. Now, I have to admit, I sure can't be dogmatic on that, but it seems to me that's what it's talking about. So I would say that chapter 319, remember I told you, based on First Enoch and the theology that was current in that day, is probably angels. I think 4, a 6 is probably men. So I make a distinction, though I think they're related. Now, the word judge there is aorist tense, which backs up what I've said. They've been, they've been judged. Completed action. It's not ongoing. Okay, it's in the past kind of thing. Um, let's see. The word live in the Spirit is present tense, which speaks of habitual ongoing action. Then in verse 7, the last little paragraph here. But the end of everything on earth is near. Wow. You know, so many people have said that uh, Paul thought the Lord was coming back in his lifetime, therefore Paul was wrong, therefore the Bible's not inspired. Jesus thought he was coming back soon, therefore we can't trust Jesus' words because apparently he wasn't. Peter thinks the Lord is near, it's been 1,900 years, therefore Peter can't be trusted, Peter was wrong. Well, I want to say to you, I do think that Jesus thought he was coming back sooner than he was. I believe that. I do think Paul expected to see Jesus in his lifetime. I think Peter expected to see Jesus in his lifetime. You say, aha, they're wrong. No, it's the conclusion that I reject. I think part of the biblical faith is that every generation of believers has expected the Lord back in their lifetime. That's part of the Christian hope. That's part of the thing that motivates us for service and love on a day by day. I want to tell you, there's a real tension in the Bible between things that have to happen first before the second coming and the any moment return of the Lord. We've got to keep those in a dialectical tension. I want to say to you tonight, the Lord can come back any glad morning. Any glad morning. Now, I think that Peter expected the Lord soon. And what he's telling us is we need to live ready. I have a sermon on this very passage called Living Ready. When the Lord comes is not even a concern to us, really. It's that when He does come, we need to be ready. And that's the biblical admonition. Watch and pray, lest you be caught unawares. When He comes, we're not even concerned. Friends, most of us, the older we get, want the Lord to come so we don't have to physically die. That's a tremendous motivation. The Lord will come in His own time when the fullness of believers have been drawn in, and we don't have to worry about physical death. And it will happen when God wants it to. But the hope for each one of us is any moment this whole roof could just open right up and the eastern sky split and the Lord comes twinkling of an eye. 
Hallelujah. Okay? The trick here is that it's near. It's a perfect tense. It's near. It's been near in the past. It remains near now. now I want to get your mind a little bit theological for a minute. Jesus said, and let me find the verses, Mark 1, 15, Matthew 3, 2, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what he meant was this. It's very strange for us to talk about the kingdom of heaven because when I even mention that to you, you automatically think of the second coming. But that is not at all how the Bible uses the term. Every one of Jesus' first sermon and last sermon was on the kingdom of God. Every parable starts out, the kingdom of God is likened to. The focal point of Jesus' preaching was the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is here and now in a real sense. It can be entered. It can be accepted. We can move into the kingdom. But the kingdom has not been consummated yet. It is a here and now thing. It is a future thing. And the Bible holds them in tension. Okay? Now, when it says the king, the, everything on earth is close to being to an end, that's a true statement. It has been close to an end. It remains being close to the end, although the end has not finally come. All right? So be serious and sober-minded that you may give yourselves to prayer. That be serious is an imperative. It's a command in Greek. Be, I, it's not talking about drinking here, though the word means be sober. It's saying think clearly. It's saying don't be duped into sleeping that everything's going on like it always went. Nothing's going to happen. Tomorrow will come. You don't have the promise of tomorrow. Stay alert. That you may give yourselves to prayer. You think Peter, thinking back on the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus took the three of them, Peter, James, and John, and said, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Stay here and watch and pray with me this hour. And he left them there to pray and he went a little further and he fell down on his face to pray. When he came back, they were sleeping. And he woke up and said, I've asked you to pray this one time. Can't you pray with me? He went away to pray and he came back. They were sleeping again. This happened three times. Peter went to sleep the very moment the Lord needed him most. You think Peter is reflecting back when he's saying, don't go to sleep. Don't go to sleep now. Pray, pray, pray. Oh, I see, I see Peter there, don't you? Oh, yeah. Existentially, I see Peter right there. Now, when it mentions um, verse 8, Above everything else, keep your love for one another fervent. Now, the word keep there is present tense. The word fervent means strenuous activity. Now, we kind of think of passive love. We come to church and we see this man and say, I love you, how are you, God bless you. But that's usually as far as it goes. We tell folks with our mouth how much we love them. But this is saying you make it a strenuous effort not to speak the words but to live the life. Let your lifestyle reflect how much you love somebody, not the sweetness of the words. Be strenuous in your love for one another. Okay? Heard that before biblically, haven't you? Over and over, over and over and over. Um, then it mentions, because love covers up a multitude of sins. Oh, what does that mean? <laughs> Oh, there's been three theories that cover every possibility. Let me give them to you. Uh, number one, when it says love covers a multitude of sins, that is a quote from Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12. So it seems that Peter has been making allusion to the Old Testament, so that seems pretty good. In, in Proverbs 10, 12, in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, it seems to imply that love does not remember a wrong against itself. So when it says love covers a multitude of sins, it's saying the one that is loving forgets the hurts that others put on it. Okay? The loving one is the one that the love in them covers the hurts of others. Now, that's one possibility. Some think it's an allusion to James chapter 5, verse 20, where... Uh, that's a hard verse, too, but it seems that love covers a friend, not itself. In James 5, as we love somebody, and as our love goes to them, the love we show to them somehow deals with the sin in their life. Not our life, their life. James 5.20. And, of course, the last theory goes back to Matthew 6, 14.15, Luke 11.25, where Jesus says, unless you forgive your brother their sins, I won't forgive you. 
And so Origen and Tertullian have picked up on this and said, the loving one, the one doing the loving, has his sins forgiven because he loves other people. You say, which is it? I don't know. I have no earthly idea which one it is. But you pay your money, take your choice. <laughs> Probably means both of them, but uh, all three of them. But anyway, I don't know. I, I just can't tell from the context which one it is. Um, now, the next little thing in verse 9, be ungrudgingly hospitable to one another. Now, the word ungrudgingly speaks of the attitude. Now, wouldn't, you know, one thing I think is a, is a farce with our welfare system is we, we get somebody who's poor and needy, we get them in a chair and say, all right, fill out this form. Here's a pencil. Fill it out, will you? Hurry up. I don't have much time. You know, we, we make receiving indignant. We take the worth from people by treating them in a bureaucratical system, don't we? We just make them feel like yuck for receiving money. Now, folks, I want to tell you, the way we give is as important as the way we receive. Unless we give in love and respect in need, I really think that our giving is probably part of the problem. Now, when it mentions here that um, hospitality... Again, if you think 20th century America, you're going to blow this whole doobie. We're first century, Asia Minor. The only holiday inns in that day were, woo, houses. Every one. Every end was a house of prostitution. Every one. That's where the riffraff of the towns went. That was the roughest part of town you can imagine is the ends of that day. When the Christians came, first, most of them were poor. They had no place to stay. It was inappropriate to live in that kind of a setting. The Christians were to open their homes to other believers to share their sustenance as Christians came to teach or go from town to town. You can't imagine the number of places. I think I have them listed here for you. All the places the Bible teaches on hospitality. Look at that. Romans 12, 13, 1 Timothy 3, 2, Titus 1, 8, Hebrews 13, 2, all admonish us to open our homes to other Christians. Now, it got to be a problem later on in the church. And some of the early church fathers said, the turkeys stay more than three days and don't work, kick them out. But <laughs> the Bible doesn't have that limit. <laughs> now, notice in verse 10, as all of you have received your spiritual talents, you must keep on using them for one another. Now, this, I can just go to seed right here, and you know me well enough to know that I could, can't you? That's why Vernon read 1 Corinthians 12, didn't he? It's the whole fact that each one of you have a spiritual gift. Not a natural talent, but a spiritual gift given at the time of your conversion. And that's exactly what Peter is saying. As all of you have received your spiritual talents. The word spiritual talents here is a word that comes from the root word chorus. Now, we call people charismatics. The, the Greek word there is charismata. It comes from the word chorus, which is grace, which means undeserved, unmerited gifts. We don't earn them. Spiritual gifts are not because we're good little Christians. We don't give the invocation Bible school. <laughs> Throw a little illusion in there. But uh, we get them out of the free grace of God. Now, every one of you have a gift. Every one of you. Let me just give you a few biblical other places the Bible talks about this, if I could. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 6. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, 11, and 18. Now, friends, you can't get around it. Every Christian is a gifted purpose, a person for ministry. Notice what it says in the next little phrase. You must keep on using them in serving one another. Keep on present tense. Your lifestyle must be characterized by using your spiritual gift for yourself. No. For one another. Spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, are given for the common good. We are gifted, not so we can wear a badge saying my spiritual gift is. We are gifted for others. The only reason for us being gifted is that we need each other. No one has everything he needs to be a Christian. We need one another. We need each other to have a church that functions completely in the spiritual gifts. 
That means no Christian is insignificant. No Christian is uh, inappropriate. Everyone is important. Everyone is gifted. And we need one another. That's why I do not push church attendance so that we can say how many folks we've had here on Sunday or Wednesday. And I'll tell you, it breaks my heart sometimes that I study as long as I do and we have a crowd like this compared to this morning. You know, I, I have not been able to motivate people for in-depth Bible study. and I, I take part of the blame for that. But I don't think we ought to be here just because we ought to be here. I think we ought to be here because the church cannot be the church unless all the spiritual gifts are functioning together. We come together a few times a week to minister to one another that we can go back out in the world and minister to others. It's like a spiritual hospital and fellowship when we come together. And if your gift's not here, the church can't be all that God intended her to be. You know, the church is not just preaching and people being preached to. It's a family, a body. Now, um, as good trustees of God's many-sided favor... First of all, I want to say to you, we're going to be given account for our spiritual gifts. I personally believe that we're going to stand before Christ, every believer. But we're not going to stand before Christ for our sins because Christ has dealt with our sins. Christ's blood cleanses us from all sin. But we're going to stand before God for how we've used our spiritual gift. If we've yielded ourselves to God's control and of ministering to others, we will give an account for it as trustees. Now, the word, the many-sided favor of God, is a word that speaks in Greek of a rainbow of colors, a variegated kind of thing. In chapter 1, verse 6, it was used for the manifold problems. In chapter 4, it's used for the manifold graces. There are people in this church that are equipped by God to minister to every need. You say, well, we pay you for that. That's half the problem of the church. <laughs> I don't have all the gifts to do it. Neither any of the rest of the staff up here. There is a gift given by God for every problem and need and hurt and goal and dream in every local church if we can just get our act together. And that's not more folks trying to preach. That's every believer realizing we're a minister. I bet you're getting tired of hearing that for five years, aren't you? <laughs> well, hang in there. In verse 11... There's two ifs. They're both first-class conditional, which means since this is happening, since this is true. If anyone is preaching, people are assumed to be doing that. Uh, if anyone is rendering service, they're assumed to be doing that. Let him do it with all the strength that God supplies. I want to tell you what. If God call, I remember when I thought I, the Lord wanted me to preach. Oh, I was terrified. Oh, it terrified me. I, I can't communicate to you the fear and the years of running that I did to get away from that call. Terrified me. Because I kind of thought that I had to minister in Jesus' name out of my own resources. And I didn't have any resources. And I was afraid to do that. And I couldn't handle that. It was too much for me. And so I ran. What God calls you to do, God equips you to do it. God never asked any Christian to do anything that God didn't supply the strength, the power, the opportunity, and the means of doing it. This is what I'm saying. What God initiates, God accomplishes. So that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. I like Matthew 5, 16, 1 Peter 2, 12. That they may see our good works and glorify our Father who's in heaven. Friends, I want to tell you, if Christians are patting you on the back, you're folks and folks the wrong ways. <laughs> People ought to know us and glorify God for it. We are not the focus. We are the channel. You don't say, boy, I just praise the Lord for my water hose. Boy, I just, that water hose is tremendous. What a tremendous water hose. No, you thank God for the water that water hose provides where it's needed. That's what Christians are. We're the channel. You don't thank God for the channel. You thank Him for the life-giving water. People ought to see our lives. Thank God in heaven for it. Okay, finally I want to summarize briefly and give you a minute to um, ask questions. The emphasis is on, number one, sound-mindedness, praying, loving one another, opening our homes, using our spiritual gifts, and thereby glorifying God. How about taking a personal inventory? Do those things characterize your life? Questions or comments? Yes, yeah, Sudi.
Oh, I think there's several good tapes I'll get to you that I've done on that. But quickly, I think we need to realize that natural talents are not spiritual gifts. Although spiritual gifts can relate to natural talents. Because you're born, 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 uh-huh. born with long fingers and good coordination may make you a great pianist. But that does not mean that your spiritual gift is music unless God touches that natural talent at salvation. Many people can do things naturally that aren't a God-given talent. God's equipping only comes at conversion. Many of us have natural gifts like athletic qualities or IQ level that come at birth. And I agree with Martin Luther that spiritual gifts are not that. Now, they can be that if they're touched by God, but they're not necessarily that. Does that help any? You know, if you can run the mile in less than four minutes, that doesn't automatically mean that God gave you those muscles for him. You know, you may just have muscles. Yeah. Thank you for that. No, I'm really not, although that forms a, a idea of what I'm talking about. There are several places in the Bible that lift different kind of gifts. Corinthians, Romans, Galatians, I think. I think that those lifts are not exhaustive but exemplary. Those are the kinds of things that God does, although the, the width of that is not uh, exhausted in those lists, okay? Oh, I think they can. Uh, we claim a whole lot. I'm not sure the Lord's... <laughs> I'm, I'm not really sure, biblically speaking, if we have one or more gifts. I know we have one. That we have many, I'm not real sure. We possibly could. But we don't have so many that we don't need other Christians. One of the parts of being, of the metaphor of being a body is that we need each other to survive. So we don't have, nobody has all of them, okay? Um, I think that many of the gifts are, are not listed exhaustively because culture changes. And the, the needs of a church in 20th century southern United States would be the same in many ways because the nature of man's the same. But it would also be culturally different from first century Turkey. And so I think the lists are not completely exhaustive, uh, but I think they're exemplary. One of the hardest things, have you ever thought about this? If God makes such a big deal out of each one of us have a spiritual gift, why didn't he tell us how to find out which one it is? Now think with me. If God makes such a big deal that we have one, why didn't he tell us how to find out what it is simply, practically, that we can do it? Theologian speaking again. The struggle in finding it for you is as important as finding it and using it. Our struggle with what God wants for our life is the character building that God wants for us, not just telling us, you have so-and-so, now use it. The development of the search is part of the gift of God. Yes. Right. Oh, you mean like two different services? Yeah, good question. Well, hopefully a little more intelligent than that, but um, that is one of the reasons that I push Sunday school so hard. You can sit in this auditorium for years and not know the person next to you. You can sit in here for years and be hurting, and my sermon not directly apply to you. But that Sunday school fellowship, that small group interaction, that people who know your name and your needs, that is where the priority of ministry will come from. Now, if there's a special hurt in there, there are special people in different age groups that we know can minister to that hurt. Example, if you have lost a young child... And it has just ripped your guts out. We're going to try to get you someone who's a Christian who's lost a young child and had to deal with that and let that believer minister to you. If you're an alcoholic and you just can't handle it, we want to get an alcoholic who Jesus has set free from that to come and minister to you. 